It's summer and we're joined by Kees van Lede, who is the chairman of the supervisory board of Heineken. He's also uh, a former chief executive of AXO, the Dutch paints and chemicals company. And he's a member of the boards of a number of other companies, uh, Air Liquide, uh, KLM Air France, Air France KLM, um, Philips, and um, Sara Lee. Sarah Lee. Yeah. There's a, a wide range of different types of company. Can you, what is the common thread in those different companies? There's little common thread. It's quite a variety. The only thing that I can say from a, a Dutch perspective, being a Dutch national, is that I now, with the exception of Air Liquide, am on the board of all the major Dutch brands almost. Philips, uh, KLM, uh, Sarli has a famous coffee brand, Dauer Egberts, which is uh, the Netherlands, uh, and of course Heineken. Brands need to live and need to innovate, and that's one of the areas where I believe you have uh, strong feelings, strong views. Uh, what are you doing to help these brands innovate? One of the roles of non-executive directors is really to try to look at the long-term uh, perspectives of a company. And there's always a balance to be struck between that and the short-term requirements of shareholders. If you take companies that have to spend a lot of advertising to keep their brands in a good position and to renew them from time to time, um, uh, that uh, may be at variance with shareholders demanding increase, increased dividends. So it's always a balance, but that's a struggle that you find very often. And I've seen situations where brands, the value of the brands eroded by uh, insufficient support from the, uh, from the marketing spends because the pressure of the stock market was such that they increased the dividends rather than uh, upped the, um, the advertising. How have you dealt with that in the past in your previous position as CEO at AXO? Little in terms of the advertising, but uh, uh, the same uh, problem um, uh, I, I had with the pharmaceutical division of, of AXO, where if you want to develop new molecular entities for new products, it takes you 10 years. So you really have to invest uh, for that. And if shareholders at the same time uh, ask for dividends, which of course is not only their good right, but that's why they invest in your company, you have to strike an adequate balance that the, the shareholders are reasonably rewarded, but at the same time you do not forfeit your long-term chances by investing sufficiently in, uh, in research. Let's turn to the beer market, if we may, as you're the uh, chairman of the supervisory board of Heineken. The beer market itself is uh, a market where innovation is increasingly being considered as the way forward in terms of obtaining market share. What innovations is Heineken uh, making at the moment? There is an uh, innovation which is very gradual over the years, that is that you, you do adapt, uh, but very, very, very little uh, on a year-by-year -year basis to changing taste. In general, I think beer has become less bitter than it used to be, and now you're speaking of a period of 10, 10 or 15 years. That's an innovation in itself. A second innovation is the way in which you drink it. And I have two examples in mind. Now you have the ice cold beer, which is a different sensation than the beer presented at, uh, at what is it, what is it uh, eight degrees or something. Uh, I'm not speaking about the British habit of drinking it almost lukewarm. Uh, that's, that's totally different. But also the way in which you drink it. You used to drink it in a glass, etc. Now people drink, drink it much more from a bottle. And then you had the cans and the bottles, etc. So uh, the experience of, of drinking beer is something that you are uh, concerned about rather. And, and plus, of course, the consistency of the product. And that is developing constantly. Um, uh, to do that, you have to have a deep insight and a daily insight almost in the drinking habits of the people uh, at, let's say, from 16 uh, uh, and over. Uh, uh, and we do have people who um, are in contact with these people. We analyze the social media, we analyze what they do, so that we can cater for their demands in a proper and a very responsible fashion, which is quite a challenge. Responsibility, social responsibility, that's a very interesting aspect of the uh, beer and beverages business. Uh, um, beer has in the past often been associated with loutish, bad behavior. How is Heineken addressing that 
potential image problem? Well, first of all, Heineken has always said to itself and to its customers that if we are not seen as a respectable company and a responsible company, in the end, we will run into a problem. They will say, they make good beer, but I mean, uh, it's not the type of company that I'd like to, to buy the beer from. And if you look over time, Heineken has been very consistent in that manner. Um, uh, uh, we have endorsed campaigns. Uh, I just mentioned that the age of 16 is an age below which one should not drink. And we stick to that. We, we, we help advertise that, uh, uh, that, that image. Secondly, um, uh, in the country that I come from, again, the Netherlands, uh, at um, uh, days like New Year's Eve or Christmas, etc., they run ads uh, in the paper saying, uh, take a Heineken, but not too much. And if you need a cab, call us. We will get you a cab to the train or something. So it tries really to balance, on the one hand, uh, the commercial interest, which is, of course, there, the fun for people to drink the product, and last but not least, to do it in such a way that society doesn't suffer. On the contrary, is proud of, uh, of a company like Heineken. I believe women are drinking more beer now, and that is also a market that uh, companies like Heineken are trying to tap. Does that involve producing a different kind of beer? I would say that Heineken is trying to convince uh, women, w women in the UK are already convinced of drinking cider more. Uh, so after the acquisitions of Scottish and Newcastle, Heineken now is the, uh, the biggest uh, producer of cider in the UK. And uh, cider is not a well-known product uh, for mass consumption in, on the continent. In France, you do have cider, but it's more of an uh, artisanal, local nature. So they, they focus on that. Um, uh, uh, women do dr drink more beer than they used to do, and you have a whole variety now of, as you know, uh, the normal beer, the, the white beers, etc. And uh, they're certainly catering for that too. And if we may take a look at the international market, uh, European sales are not as strong, I believe, as you companies would like, they're actually weakening somewhat. I think there are demographic issues, but there's also economic issues. On the West European markets, most of the West European markets, where Heineken, of course, uh, has a quite uh, a high market share since we've always been in Europe, uh, the demographics are a little bit against you because the, the age pyramid uh, changes from uh, the majority in the, uh, the, 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 the typical group that, that likes beer, that is, let's say, from 16 to 40, into a much more uh, a pillar-like uh, uh, construction where um, uh, more older people shift away from beer. So we have to readdress that. Uh, we have to refocus uh, beer as a product relative to competing uh, 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 consumption, um, the possibilities, like wines in particular. Uh, if you take Eastern Europe, particularly Russia, uh, you have seen a shift away from vodka at to to uh, uh, at the um, uh, to the advantage of beer. Um, uh, that's now sort of stabilizing, uh, where we had a lot of abuse of alcohol, as we all know. And, and uh, beer uh, was considered almost a soft drink. Uh, that is changing also a little bit. Um, the area, of course, where the age pyramid is very much in our favor are the developing countries, uh, where uh, the majority of the population is, is far below the age of 40. And there we have strong positions, not, not everywhere. Uh, we're very strong in Africa. We're very strong in middle uh, Central America and a couple of South American countries, and we have uh, a number of strong positions in, in Asia. So there we um, uh, we are uh, we benefit from number one the as I say the age buildup of the population. Number two, fast growing economies. Number three, and that comes hand in hand with the fast growth, that people change their consumption behavior from local products to more branded products, and um, uh, that's where we are. Uh, the market everybody is talking about is China. What is, what is Heineken doing in China? China is not a market where we are, uh, where we have a high market share, in fact, uh, quite small. Uh, and it's a matter of, uh, of um, uh, picking your battles. 
Uh, it's a huge market. Yeah, to get into the market was quite expensive. Uh, everyone was there. Uh, uh, and w what you buy is you buy growth. Uh, we have, for whatever reason, concentrated maybe on other markets, as I said, Africa. And in, uh, in Asia, on India, uh, we hold uh, uh, quite a substantial share together with the, uh, Mr. Malia of the Kingfisher uh, breweries in, in India. And that market, in fact, in our view, is growing faster than it is in, in China. China is a little bit the, uh, I shouldn't say the old man out, but we are there. But we are uh, almost exclusively with our premium brands. And you mentioned the issue of premium brands. How do you defend these premium brands and how do you raise their premium uh, image? Yeah, uh, uh, the, in the ideal situation, you have a number of brands uh, which are not premium, but take care of it to, to simplify the matter of the distribution cost. So you, uh, that is a bulk market. And then on top of that, uh, so you already have the infrastructure that's sort of being paid for. You introduce the, the premium brands, uh, which requires advertising, but it builds in the first place on the, uh, uh, the fact that the Heineken brand has been for years and years known in almost every country of the world. There is no brewery in the world that has a brand like Heineken, where you, you could go on in almost uh, the smallest country that is represented in the United Nations and you find a Heineken brand. But you have to convey the message. So it means that you have the signs at the door of the bar. Uh, you have to incite, incentivize, of course, the bar owner or the distributor. You have to do some advertising so that you get the same appeal to the people as, uh, as, uh, as elsewhere. And then last but not least, and that goes for all the markets, you really have to have an intimate knowledge of the, um, uh, the social and drinking habits uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the younger generation. You, you cannot sit with a generation of my age and sort of believe that you know and understand what's going on. So your age pyramid within the company, particularly those who are in touch with the market and with the publicity, should be fairly young. They should be, you see also shift in advertising to the social media, quite a substantial shift. Um, I'm not saying that we abandon television, but you, you do see that it's more going that way. Because that's where uh, the younger generation, or today's generation, I should say, spent that, spent that time. And that requires uh, a new type of investment in personnel, new type of investment in publicity, but also research into the product and perhaps less gas or different tastes or different bottle design? Uh, yes, we, we, I, I think we're extremely cautious to abandon the consistency of the product. That, that's what I said in the beginning. Over time, you may see a change in, in taste, etc. But the way in which you drink it, the, the, the temperature, the type of glass, uh, the bottle, uh, the environment, the size, the, what have you, th that you have to follow extremely closely. Uh, in, in this country, I remember uh, five or six years ago, that um, Heineken introduced the aluminium bottle, uh, which is quite an expensive sort of type of packaging. Uh, but it, it is a, a, a walking publicity because the, the habits were at that time that uh, uh, you dance on the floor with a bottle in your hand. Now, uh, if it's good visible what is, what's in the bottle, or at least what the brand is, you know, that helps you. So you, you should follow all these trends. Um, uh, packaging is, is another one. The design, the, easy, the easiness to pick up a crate. Uh, if you look at the developments of crates, it's unbelievable. They were impossible to carry. Now it's very easy. Um, the six pack, the, what have you. It is an enormous variety which follows um, uh, the constant study and analysis of the, uh, the social habits of the, uh, uh, the prime drinking group. And this summer, can we look forward to any special surprises from Heineken? Of course, you'll see them in the all, all major sports events. They are, are, are there, or, or m most of them. They, uh, Heineken always sponsors events. Uh, so, so, well, they don't, don't be really attached by uh, Team A or B, it's events, because they like people. They want to be part of the total experience of people of uh, having a good time. Uh, so when you watch sports, you, it's, you have a good time. So you have to have a good product uh, to accompany you.
Case one later. Thank you very much and cheers. Thank you very Have much. Have a good summer.